And I'm here today because I don't believe that you're defined by your past. I believe that you are loved and that you matter. And so I want you to know that this, the reason why we're here today is for that reason. And I want you to make sure that you have clean water. Um, and, and for you to know that, that uh, at least there's some of us thinking about you and that you are loved. Yeah. And dude, they, they start crying. You can't combat darkness with darkness. Only light can do that. If I can be a source of light to these guys and, and to the ladies too, like by all means, let's, let's do that. We're live here from Bitcoin Beach with Sean Kampoff, and we're going to talk about clean water, uh, arguably something that for most people is even more important in their development than Bitcoin. And I, I don't say that lightly. I don't <laughs> say that about many things. So uh, excited to hear a little bit about what their organization, it's one at a time. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. So to understand what they're doing here in El Salvador, uh, I know you guys have a long history here. We met several years ago. Yeah, um, we did. So give give us a little background on how you got into this organization that provides clean water, what your background is, and then what yeah. your guys org actually does. Yeah. So it was 2013. I I'm from San Clemente, California, and but I was, was where I grew up. Yes, only the best place yes, ever. Yes. Mine is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was. Uh, I was a pastor at a church in Costa Mesa for a long time. And there's there's this space in your life when your job is consistently giving of yourself. And but yet you don't put up like boundaries to take care of yourself. And so I was young and always meeting people and doing things. And um, and I, I just came to a place there's like straight burnout. And it's like that spot where I like I remember I actually remember this. Uh, these, this couple came up to me and they're like, hey, Sean, can you pray for me? And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, no. <laughs> but I'm like, of course, yes. And then I sat down with them and I gave them some like anemic prayer of like, whatever. I just want to go home in my mind. I'm like, okay, let's uh, say that and uh, amen. All right, see you later. And I came home and I sat in my house and I'm like, man, there is something wrong about this because I feel like, like as a pastor, you should care about people. And I didn't. And so I'm like, all right, I got to fix something. I got to put the pause button, either I need to quit my job and find something else, or I just need to figure out how I can like reinvigorate my heart to care again. So I had like apathy basically. And I remember sitting there thinking, okay, well, if it's personal to me, I'll care about it. So what's personal to me? I'm like, well, I like surfing. I don't know how that's gonna fix much. I'm like, I like coffee. I don't know about that. And then I'm like, but I also like, I like kids. Kids are awesome. It's like uh, you're in a really like boring board meeting or whatever, or, and all of a sudden a kid shows up and like comes into the space. It's like the whole atmosphere changes. You know, it's like electrifying. It's kind of like the Monsters Inc. movie, you know? And if you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it. But the whole idea is like you get energy from uh, the, the monsters will come out of the closet and scare the kids to get energy for their monster city. But then they realize that if you make them laugh, it's like 100 times greater. And it's so true because when kids are like running around laughing, minus like, if you, if you have a house in the middle of the night and you have no kids and a kid laughs, minus that, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so I was like, maybe I'll just Google what's like taking the joy out of children's lives. Um, and so I just Googled something like that. And the first thing that came up was that children around the world are dying from water related illnesses. Like that is one of the, the leading cause, if not the leading cause next to tuberculosis. And I, I remember thinking, I'm like, dude, what? Like kids are dying from diarrhea from their water? I, you know, we live in San Clemente. Like, I, I didn't know that existed. Um, I had never crossed like millions, my millions, millions yeah. a year. Like, yeah. like it's seven, some odd, like there's a bunch of numbers out there, but on average, you'll see about 700 plus million people a year. Russell struggle with lack of access to clean drinking water. And the most vulnerable are the children five and under. So there's this, like, there's a lot of statistics out there and numbers you can get lost in it. But this really cool analogy that someone told me was like, Sean, imagine a jumbo jet plane filled with children five and under. 
And imagine that there's like 600 some odd seats in that plane, right? Imagine it's filled with children 500 and that plane takes off and then crashes and there's no survivors. He said, you know, there's a weird phenomenon in the world that when a plane crashes, it makes headline news across the world. Doesn't matter how big the plane is, there's just something about it captures everyone's attention. He's like, and if a plane, a jumbo jet plane filled with children 500 crashed, it would probably make headline news. And I'm like, yeah, I probably would. And he's like, now imagine 10 hours later, another one, another jumbo jet plane filled with children 500 takes off, crashes, no survivors. He's like, at that point, the whole world would stop and say, okay, first off, why are there kids in the plane? Why is it crashing? And we got to solve it. And that's the global water crisis for kids five and under. And that just shook me to the core. And I, and I'm like, I gotta, I want to do something about that. The only problem was, is I lived in Costa Mesa and there was no one that I knew that struggled from water. Um, and so I kind of just like threw it up in the air and just like, well, if this is going to happen, then let's just make it happen and then it'll happen and we'll uh, see what goes from there. And I remember walking downstairs, opening up my fridge, and I saw this little magnet on, on my fridge, and it was a picture of a kid that my wife and I sponsor. And his name's Brian, and he's from El Salvador. And I looked at the magnet for the first time ever, and I asked my wife, and I'm like, hey, we, we give this kid money, right? She's like, yeah, we do. And I'm like, how much is it? It's like 30 some odd dollars a month. I'm like, what's it for? I had no idea. I was just like, this is how this is how dead inside I was. I was like, I don't. It's like, yeah, whatever. Um, and but she's like, it's it's for like his education and some other things for for him and his and his thing. And he's been giving us letters and stuff. And I'm like, oh. And I looked at him like, you know what? I'm gonna go to El Salvador and hang out with that kid. I don't know any kids, but I like kids. And if we're giving this kid money, then I want to hang out with him and see what it, see what is what's his story. Like maybe I could start there. And so you fast forward to about four or five months later, I find myself in El Salvador in this community called Las Delicias in San Martin. So just, you know, like an hour and ch some change that way without yeah. traffic. If there's traffic, it's going to take you four hours, um, but it's that way. And, uh, and so I'm in the community and all these kids are running around and all of a sudden I look to my right and I see this little dirt cloud running down the hill. It's like, I'm like what is that dirt cloud? And it's, it's this little kid running. He's like, John, 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 John. And I'm like, Dude, that's the kid on the magnet. He's saying my name and he's, and he runs up and he like grabs my leg and he's this little kid. He's three years old, grabs my leg, looks up at me and he goes, Hola, John. And I kid you not, like everything inside of me was like electricity just moving up into my body, into my heart. And I'm like, Oh, this kid, what in the world? It was like instantly all the like apathy of not caring, all the, all the stuff was just gone, vanished. And I, I'm holding the kid and he's like so excited that I'm here. And I'm thinking, dude, how does he know who I am? <laughs> What's, what is going on? And so I'm like, he's showing me around his house and he's like, yeah, this is, you know, it's like, this is my parents' room in Spanish, you know, and this is his room. And it's not a big house, a little tiny house. And he walks in, I walk into his bedroom and I look on his wall and I see a picture of my wife and I, and I'm like, what the heck? How's there a picture of my wife and I in his bedroom? And then he like, shows me all these letters and it's all these letters that we've written him over the over the past year signed love sean and kelsey my wife and i'm like that's not my penmanship I'm like that's my wife's and i'm like oh my wife has been communicating i'm like this makes so much sense <laughs> no wonder he knows who i am and so i'm holding him and i'm asking his mom like how's the donation is it working she's like yeah thank you so much and then i, I said well how's his health she's like well actually he's sick right now and i'm like what do you mean he's happy he's got energy like doesn't seem like he's sick and she's like, no, he has worms. And I'm like, worms from what? She's like, from our drinking water. And I'm like, no way. And so that at that point, the global water crisis for me became personal. And I think that's the case, Mike, for a lot of stuff in the world. Like there's so many things in the world going on, right? Well, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of stuff. And really we don't take action until it becomes personal to us. And that's not to anyone's fault, just whatever. It's like, yeah. if, you know, do what you can do, like whatever that is. And so for me in that moment, it became personal. And I knew that I couldn't give everyone clean water. I knew that. And there's this quote, and I'll probably misquote it, but it's Mother Teresa says something like this. If you can't feed 100, then just feed one. And that was kind of the idea that came to my mind. I'm like, well, I can't give everyone clean water here because all these kids need it. But I can at least give Brian clean water. I can at least do something one at a time. And that's where the name showed up. And so I... I sat down, I did some research. Um, I talked to some people who've been doing work down here for a long time and, and picked their brains, got some insight. I found this product that was made in Tampa uh, called Sawyer, and it was the best filter that I could see on the market. 
Um, I found it through another organization called Waves for Water, just from surfing. And uh, actually, well, funny story is I bought their filter, realized it's not their filter. They just put their sticker in the bag. Good for them. And then uh, they're great. They're great people, by the way. Yeah. We work. We work like alongside each other now. But um, they, they, I realized the filter came from Sawyer. So I contacted Sawyer, and I said, "Hey, um, how much can I get for these?" And they're like, "Well, it's this much. But if you buy a thousand, it's this much." And I'm like, "What are the odds that I can get fifty of those for the thousand dollar price?" <laughs> and she's like, "Sure." I'm like, "Great." Oh, and I kind of skipped a part before I did that. I actually asked them, you know, how many people are using these filters in this country, in El Salvador? She said, there's six. And she said, not a lot, but there's six of them doing it. And I'm like, okay. So six, I, six organizations? Six organizations. Six people? Six organizations, six organizations. using Sawyer okay. filters at the time in 2013. And I'm like, okay. So I contacted them. No one called me. No one emailed me. No nothing. And so that was when I was like, well, I'll just do it myself. Otherwise, I'm like, I'll just link up with someone else doing it. I don't need to do something on my own. Yeah. And uh, so I realized, well, no one's calling me back. This kid needs clean water now. I got to figure out how to make that happen. So I got the filters and then I um, got some really good advice of how to distribute something to where um, a lot of times we want to help people, but our help can hurt. And for those of us who are married, we know what that's like. Like anytime we open up our mouths and start talking to our wives <laughs> or especially when our wives are telling us a problem and we have this genius idea of how to fix it. And uh, we, most of us know how that ends up going. And uh, I wasn't asking for advice, just to listen. Okay, my bad. <laughs> but we can do that often in the nonprofit sector or in the church sector or anywhere, really. Yeah. We think we have an answer, but the answer really is going to hurt. And so I wanted to be cautious on how do I distribute something to someone where there's dignity involved, ownership involved in the local community and all that. And so a good friend of mine gave me advice. He said, Sean, build relationships with the local people. Let them get to know you, you get to know them, and then show them the product, what it is, show them how to maintain it, show them how it works, and then let them be the ones who distribute. And so uh, I did it. I built relationships with the local people in the area. We just, they distributed clean water to Brian and his whole community, about 50 families, and then um, it worked. We did follow up, because usually when you train someone, they're not, not everyone's gonna grasp it, so we, the leaders followed up a couple weeks later and either retrained them or just said, good job, keep going, you're doing great. And uh, when you say you distributed clean water, so you mm -hmm. gave them these filters, they had right. access already to river water or Correct. well water or something that, that wasn't necessarily clean, but they had access already to water. Yeah, so yeah. that's a great point. Yeah, they had access to water. They The water source worked perfect for the filter and in the sense that there was, there was a well that was there that wasn't contaminated from chemicals or pesticides or heavy metals because the filter won't take those out. And also salt, doesn't take out salt. And so you had all these, this is just a perfect spot to yeah. do this. Um, and it worked really well because it takes out 100% of the bacteria. Do we, Andy, do we have any pictures of the, the filters, what they look like? Um, yeah, right there. The... That's Brian. Well, that's Brian. That's Brian. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's me 10 years ago in the background, a little skinnier, less gray hair. I have more gray hair now, <laughs> but it's blurred. Uh, yeah. But anyways, yeah, so that's the filter that you see there. That's my family too, but that's a filter there. The filter attaches to a five gallon bucket. And what you have here is Brian, actually, he already got a filter and he's helping distribute to his uh, to another community. So the cool thing was like, Brian wanted to join in and help his other friends get clean water. And uh, he's 13 now. We just hung out a couple, uh, like a month ago. Um, and uh, there's a whole other story behind that, but he hasn't been sick from water since, which is super cool. And the power of that filter to last 10 years for him has been a huge blessing for their family and the surrounding community as well. But that's kind of how it started. It came out of this place of apathy and, um, and I just kind of flowed with it and yeah, it worked. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of people in the U S <clears throat> don't understand what a challenge water is because we're used to being able to like yeah. open our tap and maybe our water doesn't taste the best, you know, depending on where we're located, but it's sure. still drinkable. We don't have to worry about getting sick from it. But in right. most of the world, that just isn't the case. Even places that do have water that comes through their pipe, it is not drinkable and including here in El Salvador. And I know having raised my own kids here, they had all the different types of worms you could get. They had, you know, the E. coli, they had the different things, uh, yeah. you know, along the way. And so, and as, as we were learning, like, 
okay, you got to be extra cautious with this and you have to use yep. drinking water to even cook your vegetables in and, yep. and things like that. So I can definitely attest from from a personal perspective, just the importance of that. And, and yeah. you know, obviously we had the resources to take our kids to the hospital to to buy the medicines. But for all of these families, they don't have that. Nothing. So they literally can die if they have contaminated water. And they are. It's true. They really can, especially the kids who are five and younger because their bodies just aren't. Those things, the parasites really wreak havoc. That's just what they do inside your body. And we all know it's like, like for those of us who haven't been like infected by a parasite or some sort of bacterial infection, it's basically the stomach flu on steroids. Yeah. And it is like your body expelling from both ways and it's violent. And a, no one as a parent wants to see their kid get the stomach flu like that. You know, it's like, it's not, that sucks. And uh, this is like almost every day of their life. And it'll get like better, but it'll still yeah. be like lingering there. Yes. They're just kind of lethargic, dehydrated. And, yeah. and then you'll think like maybe they're better, but then it's still existing there. Yeah, because they continue so, to consume yeah. it. Or they just drink Coke or something else. You know, they, they find another way to, to like consume some sort of liquid. Yeah. And the problem is, is a lot of the water is clear. And a lot of people think dirty water just means that it's physically visibly dirty but no you can't see bacteria like you don't know and uh a lot of that water is very very dirty and, and it's it's not just el salvador you know it's not just central america it's in the united states as well the water crisis is different there uh, in some areas and not um and across the whole world water is a problem it's a huge problem either access to it the lack you know the lack of it the treatment of it um even to hygiene sanitation um which if there was some good things about COVID, there was at least a conversation about how to, you should wash your hands. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll do that, that now. That was the, the one, probably the one good thing. That, 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 we'll that do that now, I got that, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing a lot of people don't realize is just how expensive water is for people when they're yes. having to buy bottled water. The majority of people use bottled water if they can afford to, but if you're making, Twelve dollars a day, spending you know three dollars to buy you know the five gallon bottle yep. of water is a significant amount of your income. It's and huge. So that's what we see is the people are always balancing between like spending that extra money to get clean water or being able to buy food. And so a lot of times yeah. they'd have to just go with questionable water sources because they can't afford to buy the the drinking water. So. Yeah, it's an awful place to be in, just stuck in the middle with like not a lot of hope. Like I just is. This is just what we have to deal with. And uh, yeah. And so do you guys just operate in El Salvador or are you operating in other places? Yeah, or? we operate in other places. El Salvador is since it, not just because we started here, um, but it's our, one of our main hubs. So we have two main hubs where we do distribution on a continual basis in El Salvador and in Vietnam. So San Salvador, we have a warehouse with uh, filters and we have a team of people here. Uh, all locals that are want going out distributing and following up on the filters. And then the same thing in Vietnam um, in, a, in a city called Da Nang. And then we cross the country on both sides, we distribute. We also are working in Colombia in the north and in like the central south. Uh, we work in uh, another country uh, that can't say, uh, <laughs> but it's in the Caribbean, hey. <laughs> and they really need it. Um, we work in on Honduras. Uh, we have pilot projects happening right now in Nicaragua and Guatemala. Um, my my hope is to do all the Central America, those Central American countries, like that part, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua, to see if we can cover all those countries. Uh, well, I want to start with El Salvador just because of that, and then expand out. And then we do stuff in El and we do stuff like disaster relief works if we're asked in the United States. So there are areas where people get put on boiling notices and different places. And so we'll help with disaster relief work in the United States. We've helped in Puerto Rico in 2017. Um, we do a few other things. We we started to do some stuff in Cambodia as well and potentially Laos. But right now our focus is Central America and, and Colombia and then uh, Southeast Asia. I remember with the first time that we met uh, sitting down and uh -huh. I, I tend to just be skeptical by by nature. And I've seen a lot of <laughs> people with good hearts that want to do things, but uh -huh. come in and, and sometimes do more damage than good. Sometimes yep. just waste a bunch of money yep. and leave feeling good and not really make any change. And so my um, I think what I put to you is like, is, does this actually work? Are these buckets like 
Because everybody will take something for free. If you give them something, they're going to say, oh, yeah, we need this. Mm -hmm. And then are these buckets just winding up, you know, in the corner that mm -hmm. wind up getting used for something else? Or are they something that is actually used and used in the correct way where it provides clean water for them? How do you guys follow up on that and document yeah. that? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that we want to avoid. We know that these filters can last, you know, seven, 10 years if tr taken care of. And it's hard to change someone's behavior and how they handle something. Um, and granted, the easy way out is, yeah, it does feel good from my side to be like, yeah, we gave 15,000 filters. Cool. So what? And a lot of people say that. But for me, it's like, no, that's 15,000 families. And because th those are people. And so what we have done is created a system to where we can monitor and track the efficacy of the filter and ultimately um, the impact that it's having on a family. Now we have a data portion to it, but the most important part for us is the relationships. So relationships is paramount to what we're doing. And uh, my relationship now with our, with our staff that we have, uh, with our team, and their relationship to the local community leaders and the local community leaders relationship to the people in the, in, that are in need. So it's just kind of big, like how do we, how do we go wide and yet stay deep? So like, how do I replicate what I did, but like expand that more and multiply in that way. And so that's kind of how we've done it is just our, our intent is to sit and build relationships with these people so that they get to know us and we get to know them. And especially with our local leaders, like they, we want them to know. And so there's this relational dynamic that happens. And when that trust is built, there's this, there's this, like, I need to come back and make sure this is happening. There's just that natural, like desire to want to make sure, cause we're not pushing people to like, we got to do more and more only if we can do it well. And so, so far we've been able to do that. And in order for us to kind of track that, uh, we put these barcodes in all the filters. And the barcodes um, connect to an app that we have called mWater. And mWater is, uh, it's GIS technology. It's what a lot of people use for tracking COVID or whatever it is, it could be anything, but it's just basic technology for tracking things. I don't, I don't really know what it is, to be honest. I just know some really smart scientists are like, we should use that. And I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> so they did it. They put this form together and our local leaders ask, First, we ask for consent, like, is it okay if we ask a few questions about um, the water that you drink and how it's affecting you? And if they say yes, which they mostly do, then we'll ask these questions. On top of that, sometimes, just a side note, sometimes there's minors, 18 and younger, that are there receiving the filter. Um, our form dramatically decreases to like just a couple questions that's appropriate for a child to answer, and then otherwise we don't, or we just don't ask. Um, but if it's an adult, we'll ask these questions like, what have you been sick from? Have you been sick from the water you drank in the past two weeks? If yes, what are your symptoms? You know, headache, nausea, diarrhea, skin rash, vomiting, all those things. Then the next question we'll ask is, how much money do you spend on your water a month if you do? And then the other question is, you know, uh, how much money do you spend on your on medicine or doctor visits a month if you do? And there's a few other questions like, you know, what's your source of water or whatever. We ask those questions, we, that data then goes into our app, that app, that information then goes to a team of scientists that partner with us called Acora, and they're professionals in wastewater management, they're professionals in other water testing things, and they also created this separate company to basically solve that question. Like, how do you know it's actually working? How are you able to monitor and track the impact of the people versus, you know, just telling people and people trusting that you're, what you're saying is true? And so they created this company for NGOs specifically using this filter. And so we picked them up and they've been help, able to take that information. And then when our teams come back about a month later, they ask the same questions all over again. And what that does is it'll show us the impact or not of the filter. And typically what happens is if we don't do a follow up at all, it's about 50 percent of the people will use the filter. If we do a follow-up, one follow-up, after that follow-up, it's a 98% retention rate there on out. So the first follow-up is paramount for us, and we know that. So our teams, when we distribute, we, we really need to follow up. It was hard during the pandemic. We just kind of, you know, just do it whenever you can, whatever, whatever's, you know, going on. But now that everything's been lifted, we're able to really see that impact this past year and what it's doing on the people. And so we'll see for like 30 days after, after when they follow up, the first follow-up, you'll see you know, before they had water, 35% of the community suffered from water-related illnesses, 
headache, diarrhea, vomiting, all those things. And then when they did the first follow-up, it was down to about, it's on average five to 2%, meaning everyone's basically healthy. And on top of that, if they're spending money on water, they're saving all that money. If they're spending money on antibiotics or antiparasitics, they're saving that money. And we're able to track that. And that information we can use for a lot of things. Like for one, the fact that what we're claiming is true. Yeah. The second is that, it, you know, for people who are companies or organizations and or even individuals who want to donate and they want to see, like, is this working? Yeah, it is. Like, for example, there's a company in Indiana. They uh, have a factory of 1,100 factory workers in Cambodia. Uh, the company is called Vera Bradley. They have a lot of factories in Southeast Asia, but this one in particular, they found out ne they needed clean water. And I said, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to show you, if you partner with us, we'll show you that all this data. And on top of that, we'll be able to track to see how many days they're no, that how many days they probably would have missed, and now that they're not missing because they're no longer sick. And over the the one year study, they saw a huge increase, not just in not just in their own well being, but also in the bottom line, the fact that the workers are happy, the workers are staying and working, and the environment's better for them. And it was huge. So for the co for a company who like grants you money, it's it's paramount to like show and prove or USAID or whatever it is. And so that's what the data side of it has allowed us to show the efficacy of the filter and how it's working. So that like when you're sitting, laying in your hammock, looking at me like, bro, I've seen this before, dude. I, I don't know about these filters. And I'm like, you say that now, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you, Mike. I've trust me on this one. And you're like, okay, we'll see. <laughs> and so it is true though. I, 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 I'm skeptical even when I show back up and I'm like, are they really using it? Are they doing that because I'm here? Is it really happening? And it, it's true, they are. Like you can see it, dramatic increase. Yeah. Like little kids that I've seen that were really sick are just, as they say, fat and happy. And what you love, like that's amazing. Kid running around full of energy, uh, you know, totally healthy, no longer suffering from any any sort of, you know, bacterial infection or, or, paras or parasite. And another side of it too that I didn't mention is sometimes they're really, really sick. So our leaders will come out and they'll scout the area and say to the local leaders, you know, how many people need it? Oh, there's 2,000. Okay, well, we don't have enough for 2,000. But what we can do is we can start, you know, in this section. Let's get all the families who have children five and under. We'll start there. Um, how sick are they? And, you know, sometimes some places they have like visibly like, worms literally coming out of their skin. All right, okay, we need doctors to come in. And so, and we'll, we'll get on that really quick. And we'll bring we'll bring in doctors from here. Um, they'll provide you know the necessary antibiotics or the necessary antiparasitic, and plus access to clean water, and so that you can see the kid being healthy in the next few days, um, plus electrolytes and things like that to get them because they're dehydrated as well, as a part of the whole package to it. So we'll do that on extreme cases that are necessary. And how many people in El Salvador are you guys serving right now with, with these filters? So we've distributed 15,000 filters. Okay. Um, and it's on our website. You can kind of see, we have like all the, there's like all these blue dots on this map. And um, yeah, that kind of shows you where the filters went. It's not an exact location of where they are for the sake of like, you know, security. You're like, you know, we don't want to like, yeah. this is yeah. where you live. Tracking these people. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do that. So we just kind of like, da -da -ding. <laughs> have, have you guys ever like gone in and looked at, okay, this is the absentee rate in the, the school now. Let's look at it a year from now and see what the difference is. Have you tracked it at levels like that? No, that is really a great idea. Um, well, I think that would be great to kind of know because totally. when kids are sick, they miss school. A lot of times and their parents miss work because they yeah. have to take care of them. So no one's ever said that. Fascinating, I, that's, so. All right. Well, let's make it happen. Done. I will, so. We'll figure out. Because we do, we do distribute in schools. We also distribute in the prisons, and um, juvenile prisons and the and the adult prisons, and um, and male and female, and we uh, and, we, and the schools as well. So like basically, like our idea is like for every kid that's in the community, what's what's all their touch points for water? Is it this? It's a school, potentially a church, or a community center, or whatever. And let's provide filters in those locations as well. But we've never tracked the. You know that like how how often kids are missing school because of water, and now not. I mean, that's something that I feel like the Department of Education will probably be interested in. <laughs> no, I think it'd be fascinating yeah. to see just what the general absence. You know, obviously there can be other reasons they miss, but that yeah. is 
probably half the time the reason they miss in El Salvador would be because of some type of waterborne illness. So it is, be yeah. Very interesting to, to do like a before and after and kind of see totally where that would put you. I um, like that. What wh what do you guys do in the prisons? Like, how how does that work? Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know if you're allowed to talk about that or so if you're not, then, uh, I can, I can talk about that. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, we work with a prison, uh, ministry in El Salvador. So just a local prison ministry. It, it came about just by like, you know, doing good work in the communities and people hearing about it. And one of the guys heard about it and he's like, Hey, would you guys be open to providing clean water to the juvenile prisons and the adult prisons? And this is before the, the the brand new prison got put in place. Um, and I said, of course, yeah, let's do it. And so we've been providing clean water to, I don't know how many of them, but quite a few. I've been to two of them. Uh, I've been to three of them. I've been to one juvenile prison and I've been to two adult prisons. I was just at one um, in, two months ago in Santa Ana. And... Uh, well, I, as you know, like it's it, the prisons now are just uh, there's a lot of prisoners in them, and the living conditions aren't great or ideal. Hence, why I think they built the largest prison, one of the largest prisons in the world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I we go in there and we just do the same thing. It's distribution. In my so will they just have like a water tap somewhere that that's mm -hmm. or a bucket that's where they get their water from, and it's yeah they got a water source. Uh, yes. So they have a water source. It's usually like a tank that's up here and it comes down. Um, but everyone's sick from the water. And so we test the water beforehand to make sure it works. So our scientists analyze it. Um, we do that at, at pretty much every location, unless there's already previous testing. Make sure there's not chemicals or exactly. something that couldn't be filtered out. Yeah. Cause we don't want to promise something we can't yeah. deliver on. So we, we test the water, uh, the water is, you know, filled with E. coli or whatever. And so we're like, okay, this will work. And so we just set up a day where we, it's a, uh, like a half day where we go in and, get security clearance from the, the warden or whatever. And uh, we get in there and everyone is so excited. It's a dude it is a trip. <laughs> I'm standing there and you know, these are like really rough dudes. And the cool thing, like, is I get to stand there. I'm like, look, you guys are here, you know, in prison for things that you've done in your past. And I'm here today because I don't believe that you're defined by your past. I believe that you are loved and that you matter. And so I want you to know that this, the reason why we're here today is for that reason. And I want you to make sure that you have clean water. Um, and, and for you to know that, that uh, at least there's some of us thinking about you and that you are loved. Yeah. And dude, they, they start crying and they roar, like the clapping. It's like, I got chickens again, just thinking about it. Like, and someone, someone asked me like, Sean, well, how could you like go into a place like that knowing what they've done? and knowing that they've taken dignity out of other people's lives. And I said, well, that's true, but it doesn't give me the right to do the same. Yeah. Like you can't combat darkness with darkness. Only light can do that. I think Martin Luther King Jr. said something like that. And uh, and that's the idea is like, I, I could be a source, if I can be a source of light to these guys and, and to the ladies too, like by all means, let's, let's do that. Let's give them something we can do clean water and provide it. And, uh, the warden stoked and they're like, yeah, like we, the, the guys need that. We don't want them sick. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's a nightmare that's for a them nightmare. to deal with. And, they're, and there's like 50 guys in one cell kind of thing. Not a one cell, it's kind of hard to describe, but there's like a bunch of bunk beds. And yeah. They're all, you know, living together. And like, here's a little bit of relief. You don't need to be suffering from this, you know? Um, so yeah. And so they'll uh, just set, set these filters up mm -hmm. next to the water source. Yeah. And yeah. They'll just keep refilling them. Yeah. And that's where people get their okay. water from. Do like than... water stations, you okay. know, all throughout the prison. And so that they can always have access to it. Sometimes like we'll, we'll give them options. Like you can take like a larger drum and you can attach like, you know, four filters to it, drop it down so that more people can use it and they get clean water. And we'll do the same thing in schools too. Like if there's a lot of kids in the school, we'll just attach a bunch of filters to like okay. a larger, you know, plastic thing or whatever. And, that way it's like a water station versus like a personal one that you'd give to a family. Yeah. 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 I had uh, a, a close friend that this was several years back that he, he wound up in, in jail for, yep. for a time. And um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I mean, no, we had to bring water and food yep. and, and everything because they had no, I don't think 
I don't know if they had no water source or just no like drinkable water source, but so probably no bring, drinkable water source. Yeah. We would bring the uh, plastic bags of water. Yeah. And he said that they actually in this prison, they would make hammocks out of these plastic bags. They would weave them together because <laughs> there were so many of them there. Yeah. And that's what they would sleep in. And he yeah. said that it was, but it, it was like the very basic things like having clean water was something that, you know, was was very dire. Yeah, it was it's huge. Yeah. And are you still able to get access to the prisons? Even mm -hmm. I know they, you know, had these extreme lockdowns and it's yeah. you have the state of exception right now. Yep. Has has your guys' access been curtailed no, or is that no. okay? No, all that stuff's there. The only difference is that there's just a lot more people. Yeah. That's it. Like there's just more people that need it. Um, I don't know where we are currently with the prisons and, and where we need to go next. Um, but we are we just let the prison ministry know we're available for that if you guys need it. Like anyone in there, if our filter can work, then we'll give it to anyone. Yeah. Like water, I think, is a human right. We need access to it. Uh, we don't realize it. Well, I mean, we can pay for it. Um, we don't realize how important it is. Uh, for people who just can't have access. And if we have a tool that can do it, we'll just give it to everyone. We can. Well, like you're saying, the, the cost of, I think you said these filters, mm -hmm. not just the filter himself, but all the follow up and all the things you guys do on your end, it winds up being about a hundred dollars yeah. a unit. But you look at the lost productivity in a family from being sick all the time and the, the medicine, not, not to count the human suffering, but just yeah. the financial cost of, of having this continual sickness is way more than a hundred dollars. And so, Oh yeah. And, and just a year. And so you guys are able to give them something that lasts for many years, yeah, many for, years. for such a reasonable amount. It seems, you know, like very low hanging fruit as far as improving people's lives. Yeah, no, it's, it's like a fast track to that. It's incredible. I mean, the global water crisis consists of a few things, access to water, treatment of water, and then education, water, sanitation, hygiene, usually it was called wash. Usually people think about the water crisis and think about access to water, you know, which are digging wells and or water catchment. And those are necessary in a lot of places, especially because we're going into an El Nino and El Salvador for an El Nino. A lot of the people in the environmental side of things in the in the government are concerned because they're looking at a drier season up until 2027, they're saying. And that's well, we, we haven't got any rain hardly this right? year and we're supposed to be in the midst of rainy season. And that's it's, what they're saying. Yeah. So they're concerned about water scarcity. So there's. There's dirty water, but there's also water scarcity. And so a lot of times you'll hear about, you know, oh, I know this water NGO that does this. Most of the time what they do is access to water, digging wells. And those cost 10 to 15 grand. And they have a lifespan, you know, five years maybe, or maybe more, maybe less, depending on how you maintain it. And then there's treatment of water. And there's a lot. There's biosand. There's, you know, uh, activated charcoal. Um, there's all different areas. But the Sawyer filter, I think, is the best one on the market for what we're trying to do for the longevity of it. And then there's wash. So it's like hand washing, uh, even latrines could be put in that category too, you know, finding a place where you go to the bathroom versus like in your own water source and all those things. So diluted bleach, just using soap, not antibacterial soap because that's actually not beneficial, uh, but that's a whole nother microbiology thing that I learned about, um, but just soap is good. Or you can use the hand sanitizer if it has 70%, you know, um, alcohol in it, then that'll work too. Uh, but cleaning your hands, cleaning your surfaces, all that stuff. Um, I mean, ultimately, bacteria is everywhere. Yeah. You can't help it. But a very small percentage, uh, like 0.1% of that bacteria is really detrimental. And uh, that's what affects you. And specifically E. coli, because that's the most studied bacteria scientifically that we know about. And, uh, you know, we have E. coli in us. A lot of E. coli is good. But this, the one that's not... It's not good. No, it's and not it good. is. <laughs> it's awful. It is awful. Yeah. I can attest. I uh, <laughs> I had about a few years ago, yeah. and uh, my daughter at the same time. Oh. And so it was. Yeah, it was horrific. She she wound up in the hospital yep. for several days. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's it's no joke. It is I, no I do joke. Not want to experience that again. <laughs> no, and that's that's what we want too for others is we don't want them to experience that again. Yeah, and so that's kind of what we're doing. Just yeah, and I feel like in general we used to get much sicker in El Salvador. More recently, I feel like overall the conditions have improved. Obviously, yes. there's, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of families still in, in dire need. Yep. But in general, everything has improved so much in this country. It's been a long time since I've had any waterborne sickness, yeah. which I'm very thankful for. Um, but I'm curious, yeah. 
you, you've been here almost as long as, as I have, you know, working in the country. And, mm -hmm. and what have you seen over the last decade and, you know, <laughs> from where we came from to where we're at? And, and even the communities you guys work oh, in are, are, I'm sure, were no-go zones a lot of times. Most and of so, them, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're whatever you, red zones or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> I could, like, I think I got off the plane last year maybe and as i got off the plane i could feel it was different i don't i don't know what it was but it just felt lighter yeah i don't it i'm like that's interesting and then you just walk around i'm like this is something different happening here like the whole country has completely shifted um on so many different levels and there's a lot of different reasons behind that obviously leadership is there and making decisions and and, and putting things into action um I uh, like the gang violence whether it was 18th street or ms you know areas where we worked um 2014 2015 2016 2017 2018 quite goodness good gravy <laughs> like we're not like I, i'm coming in you like see dead bodies in the street all day long. I, not all day long that's dramatic but yes yeah like uh a fair amount of times especially when i was down here in one of the more bloodier days uh i think i forget what year it was but there were I had chopped up body parts, people just lying in the gutter. And, I, and I'm like, and you know, it was bad, like really bad. And 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 all the news that you hear from people in the States and that they would tell me, you know, you're going down to El Salvador, it's not safe, it's not safe. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. But it's not safe if you're just a tourist in San Salvador gonna go walk around. Like you just wouldn't, you just don't do that because you don't know the area, you don't know the people, yeah. you probably don't speak Spanish, like all those things. For us, we literally went two places. We went to the area that we were accepted in by the gangs and the church, but primarily through the church because they had agreements with the gangs. Plus the gang members were like 18, 12, 18 years old. They grew up there. Yeah. So we we had relationships with those people in that area and then to the beach in El Tunco. And that was it. Like that's all I did was hotel at San Salvador, get in the car, go to that location, come back to the hotel, back and forth, back and forth, last day, go to the beach, see if I can go surf for a little bit if there's waves and then go on the airport get in the plane and head home I never really explored too much i went to downtown san salvador uh the uh like the or the i don't know the square is the main square yeah. and there was a that was crazy that was wild and then now i go to have you been downtown lately i have not i've seen all the Dude, pictures but i'm like next i gotta go there level. at least so i can believe it it's, it's, it's i've never seen yeah. anything like i'm like i'm literally walking around going like what is this is it's all cleaned up it's beautiful it's incredible so like for me like the change is dramatic i would rather <laughs> i feel like i'll say anyways i feel like i'd rather have my kids go to school here than where i live let's just say that yeah i this place has changed so dramatically in so many ways that it just feels like for the first time i'm like I've always wanted to live here because I love it here, at least part time, kind of like what you did. I was a little jealous of that. My God, you did a part time, but that's cool. I like that. Um, but I actually could live here, live here um, because of that reality of how dramatically it's changed. And the cool thing is, is like the people and leadership that I talk with, their heart for the people too. Like they're incredible. They love their people. Like I think the reason why some of that water that you're not having issue with is the president of water and infrastructure, the president of what's called ONDA, his name's Ruben. He's done a fantastic job over the past two and a half years that he's been in office. And uh, he just finished a desalinization plant. Um, I don't know exactly where, but it's a little bit further south of here on an, an island. And it's benefiting 600 families. And it's just, that's incredible. Like to be able to have the resource to do that, the follow through to do that, the backing to make that happen from the government to do a desal plant like that, and the professionalism that he had behind it was amazing. So there's a lot of like pluses with the leadership and the people coming together and, and actually solving problems. Granted, there is no one's batting a thousand. No one ever does that. There's always something that you can find and, and you get hung up on. That's fine. I get that. But I can visibly feel and see, I, I could visibly see and I could feel the change from 2013 to 2023. That is like night and day different, a complete 180 in my perspective. So, yeah. Yeah. And anybody who knows me well knows I'm, I'm not 
one who often has kind words for government officials anywhere, anywhere in the world, <laughs> you know. But I've just been impressed over and yeah. over again just by the work ethic and the the holistic way that they look at things and tack. I mean, I've I've been in all kinds of like community meetings with high level government officials that yeah. it's like eight o'clock at night and they're yeah. in this meeting with the community. Yeah. Where in the past it was like, oh no, it's three o'clock, it's time to go home. I mean, now they are some of the hardest working people that I know. He's the president of water, uh, it's called ASA, the president of ASA, his name's uh, President Castaneda. He, uh, he heard, he, we, we pitched this project to the, to the government and we said, hey, we wanna give you know 30,000 families access to clean drinking water. Um, and we would love to have some of your support. Um, obviously we're not asking you for like to pay for things outside, like this is taxpayer dollars, but you know, we're doing a lot in country, maybe you can help. And so we've been in conversations of trying to figure out what that could look like. And it seems like we might have something coming into the next year or so, um, as we're having conversations. But the cool thing about both the president of ONDA, who's water infrastructure, and then the president of water or ASA, there's like this, there's two different components there. Um, they both wanted to see it. And so the pre the president Castaneda went to a community himself and with our one of our leaders just to see it working. He actually like, like he's not standing behind a thing and doing, you know, and I'm sure there's parts of that obviously yeah. because of politics, but yeah. he actually did it. And I thought that was super cool of like, dang dude, you took time out of your day to go to a rural area, not close to San Salvador. Not to, convenient to get not to. Not convenient at all. You went in there, you hung out with the families and you asked questions. Because then asking questions, showing me you care. And he's like, this is really good. This is working. And so that was just like, it was just really neat to see that from that perspective. I'm, I, politics, whatever. Uh, it, but I look at not necessarily someone's title, but their heart. Yeah. Like, let, let me see, let me see it. Like, what do you got? And, and these guys have done like the conversation I've had, they've just been really great. It's been a breath of fresh air. And I can see why things have changed in certain areas, you know, because of that. And you have people who have power because of their position and uh, they are using that, or at least we're hopefully going to leverage that power for the powerless to give them access to water. And so if we can find a way to collaborate with that, then yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, there definitely seems to be this feel of we're public servants. Yeah. So yeah, which which you usually don't see. Yeah. So <laughs> it is, like you said, it is a, a breath of fresh air. We've seen that working yeah. with the the Minister of Housing, she's just this amazing woman. And, you know, even in, sometimes it gets rough when you're dealing with families sure. and they have certain expectations, can't be met. But yeah, like I think it was two weeks ago, she was down here, you know, sitting down with the families, hearing their concerns. And you can't always make everybody happy, but to see a government that's out there trying to do the hard work, it's, it's easy to throw out big numbers like, oh, we're going to do this and that, but to actually like get it done is something more challenging and that's what i love about the way you guys approach it because for a lot of ngos they're they're just number driven i mean part of it is like okay how many of buckets can we get or filters can we get out how mm -hmm. we can do these things but to really have an impact you really have to develop those personal relationships but those take time and effort and you're yeah. not going to get to as many families but in the long run you're actually going to help a lot more so i love seeing your guys hard in that and yeah the, the approach that you take yeah, that's, I mean, we tell our, just telling our leaders, like, you know, when you see that child, that's like your child. Like, imagine that being your kid. That's how we look at it. Like, every, that, every kid matters. Every family matters. Like, we should give our undivided attention to them and give our best in those situations. And then to continue to encourage other people in the areas to do the same. It's not like, I just, I have to do it all. I don't, I don't know, you know, many of them, really, just some. Really, it's just Brian for me, to be honest. And I still hang out with him, yeah. you know, like. We'll still take them, you know, and, and and the cool thing about Brian too, actually, is that in, during the pandemic, when I came, when they opened the country back up, in I think September, um, twenty twenty, I took like the first flight down. That was a trip too, because like the flight attendants had like hazmat suits on and stuff. Well, I'm like, oh man, this is this is next level. <laughs> but I got down there, right, and I'm, I'm in the community and I'm hanging out with Brian. That's Brian. Right That's there. Brian. Yeah. Yep. Do we have him in any of the? Is he in the videos that we have? Yeah, or? I don't think so. I don't think I. Why don't you roll video. roll those videos anyways, Andy, just so people can have a, a better sense of of so is That's my family. Okay, that's your family. Yeah, that's and my that's wife in and El kids. Salvador. Yes, that's in that's in Las Delicias. That's okay. in Brian's community. Yeah. 
And that's just a picture of showing the difference. So you have that dirty water there. Okay, so the that's the water hand. that they actually put into the filter. Yes, that's the difference. The one that looks like lemonade. Yes. <laughs> so most, but most water is clear that we deal with. It's okay. not always visibly that dirty. Yeah. That's just having fun. <laughs> the filter, the water is going through that filter out and, and it's dripping down. And this kid come, came running, running over and he put his mouth under that and everyone's laughing. <laughs> Um, that's after a distribution. We just so happened to get that little kid smiling. We're like, that is so awesome. Yeah, I love that. Picture. Uh, and just a side note, like when we take these photos, these images, we ask for permission to show them. I tell them, Hey, look, I'm going to use this for like, I'm going to put these on flyers. It's going to go on social media. Are you okay with that? And they, they're all like, yeah, of course. No problem. I think we had a video. Yeah, this that... is. So this is a video that you can see on our website too. So if you can go, if you go to our website, which we'll show later where to go, but you click on that little um, arrow button and it'll load up. So this is a kid in Uganda. And this is his water source. This is what he drinks from. So he puts and that. Would, would this be typical of some areas in El Salvador? Yes, some. Not all, but some yeah. for sure. And so they carry it. They dump it that dirty water into the bucket. They drop the hose down, out comes clean drinking water, just like that. And so there's no, you know, essentially there's no bacteria in that water. It takes 100% of it It doesn't out. take any electricity or anything no, else. It's all it's gravity all fed. Gravity fed and, the maintenance, um, there's only one, there's one simple maintenance process to that. We'll give them like a syringe. They'll take clean water in that syringe and they'll just back flush the filter. So okay. all you're doing is, it's for flow rate purposes. And uh, so if there's, it's like really, really dirty water. You gotta back flush it push it back in. That's the part where we spend time training on. So when we know the filter's not working, it's usually because they're not maintaining on a consistent basis. Yeah. So we'll come back and follow up on that. That makes sense. And then this is in, I think this, yeah, this video here is me. I'm in a community uh, in just outside of Mizata up in the mountainous region there. And uh, all these kids were really sick. And so I, I'm like, all right, we gotta get filters up here like real quick um, because these kids are not doing well. And so um, we, in, in this area, we basically, in this video, we're sharing about, you know, the fact that people are, are sick, what it's like, what it's feeling, that there's a global pandemic. I'm using that kind of language because we were talking about pandemic when we filmed this. I'm like, this is a pandemic that's always existed of water and how we make a difference. And basically by empowering local leaders in their communities to make a difference. And so here you'll see a local leader. He's taking the time to train the people. He's speaking their language, their, their way of doing things, showing the resources. We bring buckets in, um, we show them how the filter works. And I mean, these are the areas, this, this actually, this location is in the Southern part of Colombia. It's uh, far removed, but yeah. And then this is the, the difference it makes. You put dirty water in that bucket, drop the filter down, out comes clean drinking water, just like that. And that's in all areas. So you can see this like dramatic difference there in that area. And that's all over in El Salvador. Yeah. Like there's 14 states, districts, or whatever provinces, whatever you call them. And in every all 14 areas, there's areas mainly in the mountainous regions that are in need or very dry regions. But yeah, that's the video. That's in El Salvador. That's by Tasajeda. By where? Tasajeda. It's like um, so if you Is go that real Lampa? Oh, I don't know about that. Okay. Maybe. So you know where the airport is? Yeah. And as you're as you're going towards you're going south from the airport, uh, headed that way along the coast, you can cut in and there's like a place where you a bunch of boats, there's yachts down there. There's like, Okay, one of the estuaries. Yeah, then. one of the okay. estuaries. Yeah. So there's a couple islands on there and mangroves, and there's families that live on those islands and they all need to clean water. And so that was us going to do a distribution in one of those areas. Do you guys do anything on La Pariah? Pariah? Um, I, if you go to the website, we can, I can show okay. you, we can zoom in on a map. Just curious We're we're doing, uh, we're basically Bitcoinizing that Island right now. We have somebody Where is it? out there. It's in, um, yeah, it's, it's in that area. It's, it's down, it's further, further south, south or east. However you want to look at it from, yeah. um, like Costa del Sol. It's like the next estuary down. Costa del Sol, I think is where, we, that's where we were. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So this is the next one down from that. Um, I think we're going to be having distributions there soon because we've spotted a few places. Well, let's talk more okay. about that after this. Yeah. Um, and see what we can do. Actually, maybe we can. I'll talk to our local leader 
uh, I talked to our, our basically our executive director here, Cynthia, and I'll ask her if she knows about it. And then maybe we can get some Bitcoiners come together and we can all just do a whole distribution, watch the lo our local leaders come and distribute yeah. clean water there. No, I'll, I'll reach out to Quentin, the guy who's on the ground there. He's actually living on the island okay. right now and, and see what, what the water situation yeah. Is I I think I know you're not a Bitcoiner, but I, you said you've already had. Some, I have uh, some Bitcoin. So you have some Bitcoin. I okay, do. All right. Awesome. I got a, awesome. What is it? Coinbase or something? Yeah, you got you got to get it off Coinbase. <laughs> you got to take self custody of that. I so, don't know. Like, I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. I'm yeah, gonna... We, we got to help you with that. Please so, help me. <laughs> uh, so you're you got your you got your toe in, but now we got to get you to to hold your own. I need to fully immersed. Yeah. Baptize me in Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I know uh, you said uh, Nikki. Nikki and James, yes, had, uh, they, which are Bitcoiners that are down here. They have their own YouTube channel. We've had them yeah. on the podcast. And you said they showed up to one of your things? Or yeah. how did you connect with them? Uh, yeah, that was funny. I was, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know how long ago it was, but I think they were just like fresh from coming from New Zealand. And uh, we were doing it just, we do, we partner with uh, this coffee farm up in Awachapan and they we've have we have this whole thing where um we connect coffee companies in the united states to this coffee farm they purchase uh the beans the green beans from them they uh then import or e export import the beans to these coffee companies they roast the beans they sell it you know at a coffee shop in san clemente like bear coast they're a part they sell they sell the beans a portion of that goes back to us and then goes to the coffee farmers who pick the cherries and so we try. I tried to create this like cool little like ecosystem, so to, so to speak, where it's a win 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 for everyone. And so we've been providing coffee farmers clean water for the past couple of years now in El Salvador and also in Honduras. And we were at one of the distributions in the at the coffee farm. So the coffee farmers came out, the families came out, and I'm 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 just kind of checking in, seeing what's going on, talking to Jorge, the guy who's in charge of the farm, and and I had some of my friends with me, and all of a sudden I see these two gringos and i'm like what wait so i walk off like hey guys how's it going they're like and then they had a you know new, new zealand accent and i'm like are you guys from new zealand and they're like how'd you know i'm like well my sister-in-law is from new zealand so like, it's like it's a, just a rough guess i can't really tell the difference <laughs> but i'm glad i got it right um when we started shopping, yeah, they don't like when you call them australian no so. no no that's a big no no <laughs> <laughs> so I, i'm like whoo i got that one but yeah, we were talking and uh, they're just sharing their story, you know, with me about how they how they came here and why they came here. And they're educating me on Bitcoin and how it's and how and, and how it can really benefit the community. And I knew a little bit about just from your story, a little bit about, you know, about Bitcoin and how it's helped El Zante and and the idea behind it. And they were giving me other like case studies and stories of people like the guy with the hotel using it and how it's benefited him. I'm like, I. I'm all for it. Like that's great. I mean, anytime you have some sort of collective agreement uh, on some on something that has a value, you could do a lot with it, especially yeah. with something like Bitcoin. And uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I met them. It was really random. And I'm like, how do you know Jorge? And Jorge's into Bitcoin. He does Bitcoin, I think, with his coffee company. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Jorge. yeah, so Jorge, that's the coffee we get that we you know. Okay. That Bear Coast sells and places and so so we recently bought a coffee farm. And you did? Jorge has been helping us with with some Dude, stuff. So the, Jorge and his like team, they're fantastic. Yeah. They're incredible. This coffee's yeah. insanely good. Yeah, <laughs> he, we we did a cupping this year. And we, oh yeah, he's teaching us all the things how to like rate coffee. Did and, you go to his farm too? So no, I have not been to his. Oh, farm Oh, you got to do so, it. It's uh, insane. Yeah. It's really yeah, cool. That's, that's so funny. It's a small world. So I'm curious to, uh, you know, as somebody who's not really in the Bitcoin space, but yeah. you're working here in El Salvador. Yeah. What is your perception of of what where you see Bitcoin mm -hmm. bringing benefit, where you see it not working, or what you're just uh, just your broad level view of of what you've seen? Okay, so I'm gonna just plead straight ignorance. Uh, I'm super ignorant about Bitcoin, but I, what I can do is just witness to what I've ex what I've seen. Um, I think the idea behind it makes a lot of sense. I think that maybe it was a little early, maybe, maybe I don't know for the whole country to adopt it. Um, but at the end of the day, like who's to say? Yeah. Who's to say on timing? To be honest, like yeah, whatever. Um, but I love it. I think. It's a great idea, and I think it can work. Um, 
as long as you know more people learn about it people what people aren't up on they're down on that's just kind of how it works and uh and i think there's other things too that of like pr of bitcoin in el salvador has positives and negatives of how people see it i just saw the other day a sticker that said with a sticker with bitcoin and the x through it yeah. on the bumper and i'm like <laughs> I don't know. What's funny, Bitcoiners <laughs> love getting those shirts. When they come here, they're like, I want one of those shirts just to, <laughs> just to have as a memento. So. Yeah. I, I, and I just, you know, there's, depending on how someone sees it or how it's been presented to them and how they thought about it, they've created their own myth, their own narrative behind yeah. it. Um, obviously, it hasn't been personal to them necessarily. So they haven't, you know, it hasn't, they haven't experienced the benefits that it can provide, but it will get there. I mean, you have those Chivo, you know, things everywhere. And uh, so there's that's a that's incredible. So I think for me in Bitcoin, the only thing that like the only time when I really think about like, man, I need it would be great to have crypto um, personally is with my nonprofit, to be honest. I've had countless people. It's kind of died down a little bit, though, but I've had countless people give me like, Sean, like you need to be able to put crypto as a donation option on your website. I'm like, cool. How do I do that? How's that work? And I've gotten like, use this service and that service. I'm like, that's expensive. I don't want to pay monthly for that because I don't even know if anyone's going to actually donate crypto. Um, and and then I, this other person's like, get a wallet or this. And I'm like, bro, I don't know what language you are communicating in. And I feel like this when I communicate to a lot of the big Bitcoin people, which is fine, is it's it's like it's its own language. And uh, and there's a lot there. And I'm lazy. I guess like the I'm, I'm taking the heuristic way of doing it. I'm just like whatever's the easiest approach. Just just tell me what I should do, you know, like for investment. Just tell me what I put my money in. I don't care. <laughs> but well, we're, we're we're gonna have to work on you here. here I little. need. But what, there are some great what I'm saying. Great companies open. that that yeah allow yeah. for people to give. Um, there's yeah there's a couple of great ones that I, that I can connect you with. And yeah, I yeah. think I think with uh, I I personally think it's great. I just. Uh, yeah, I, I had a feeling that we were going to talk about Bitcoin <laughs> and I was like preparing myself. I'm like, I don't know anything about it, but I know I want it. And I know that it, I, I'm, this may sound like, like maybe overplay, but I know it is the future. I, I know that. And those who have early adopted, early, early adopted it have obviously benefited now because of it, even at the price point that it is today. Which I think is like twenty seven thousand or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. See, I do know some yeah. numbers. But honestly, I just googled it before I got here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, the uh, I, I do think that it is the future, and I would love to learn more about how I can incorporate that, not just with a nonprofit, but also my personal life. Because the more I'm going to be doing work in El Salvador, the more I need to understand yeah. this. Well, and it just makes moving value around so much easier. You know, yeah. Sometimes just trying to get money in El Salvador, even if you have the money in the U.S., is a pain and yeah. you run into all kinds of problems so this is a system that's open to everybody and then in the communities where you go the same people that don't have water also don't have access to the banking system and so for them to oh, yeah. first time have access to electronic payments so yeah. a way to save in an account that's secure that nobody can you know just break into their house and rob from them yeah and the so, fact that it's like that part yeah that part is super attractive like no one's going to take this from you We've kind of. seen the, the the there's a project in uh, South Africa called Bitcoin Akasi, and it's working in one of the townships uh -huh. in, in South Africa. And just hearing the stories from them of like, yeah, the kids now they're you know their mom or dad used to steal all their money from them and go use it to to buy booze, and now if they're earning in <laughs> Bitcoin, and the the parents are mad because they can no longer steal it from them. Like yeah. they don't they they can't access it, and so. Just things like that for people that live in situations that are foreign to us. We don't think like, yeah. oh, it's even your own family you'd have to worry about. But for a lot of people, that is the people who are stealing from them the most. And so totally. you have all these opportunities that are that are opening up to people in, in a lot of different ways. And do we have, can you put the picture back with that bucket? I was just, just thinking of something. Um, I think it was the, yeah, that one there. So I would love to see some some Bitcoin orange uh, buckets, but then us <laughs> well, to get some some Bitcoin <laughs> companies to hey. 
to sponsor these buckets and put their logos By on means. them. So we'll have to we'll have let's to try to drum let's that. Let's figure out. that out. We we actually don't use the Beedry buckets anymore because they're too expensive. We okay. have a bucket guy just out, just before like in, near Santa Ana that it, so they're different colors, yeah. but we can figure that out. That's an easy one. No, but I think that would be something great for these because there's a ton of Bitcoin companies now that are moving their headquarters to El Salvador yep. that really want to dig deep here, and so. I would love to see, you know, I like that their their names on these buckets, and obviously they'd have to pay for them, uh, yeah. But make it happen. But, but that they, drops the they cost know, for us, yeah. And they know that they're they're providing clean water to these families, and totally, so it's like a win win for everyone. So I love that idea. I have I have a question that. about Bitcoin. Yeah, now. let's say, well, not not just let's say I am someone who knows very little about Bitcoin. What would you say to someone like me? Like, here's like the first few steps for you to either take or consider when it comes to Bitcoin. Not and even for like someone in El Salvador too, like like think about these things or take these next steps. What what would you say to something like that? So for somebody like you, I would say just to I think it's helpful for people to understand like the big picture before you get into the details. Right. And so a book I always recommend to people is the Bitcoin Standard. And it's okay. it's really talks about the history of money and why we think that the money is going to shift to Bitcoin being the base money in the world. And it looks at, I mean, going back tens of thousands of years and, you know, money yeah. throughout history. And so I think that is something to give you a overall basis um, for understanding it. There's another book um, written from a Christian perspective called Thank God for Bitcoin that also does a good job <laughs> of, awesome. of laying that out yeah. and, and just looking at it biblically about the importance of having just money that you know, people can't just inflate and create out of thin air and having a, a money system that's oh, just for everybody. That's a good point. Um, so I, I always recommend those two books. And then for me, podcasts are the best ways to to go out there. So there's a number of, of different good beginner series podcasts. Um, I know Peter McCormick, uh, What Bitcoin Did, does, does a great one. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Robert Breedlove has done a good one. So there's a number of great podcasts out there. This, but to not get overwhelmed, to understand like the overall, like why we believe it's moving in this direction. Yeah. And then just start transacting in it and understanding how to transact and then how to hold your Bitcoin yourself and get it off Coinbase. Um, <laughs> done. And uh, yeah, hold it in a, in a hardware wallet. But I think for somebody like you who's moving around all the time and understands how challenging it can be to, mm -hmm. to move, you'll quickly see like, oh, wow, this is so much easier if we can do it in Bitcoin. Before, we used to have all these problems trying to get money to pay our bucket Currency person or this thing. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I think there could be a lot of, you know, really low-hanging fruit for you guys. And, yeah, especially because all the stuff we're doing in El Salvador, too. I feel yeah. like that is like a no-brainer to start incorporating that. And I think even... El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin and, and obviously the transformation that's happened here is can be part of your guys' success story. Like, hey, this is the country that, that we're involved in. It used to be nobody knew where El Salvador was. So now, true, yeah. now I feel like people are like, oh, El Salvador, I've heard this or that. You know, it used to be all negatives and yeah. now it's positives. So hopefully that will encourage people to support you know, your guys' organization. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. You never know. Yeah. So currently you guys are trying to do 30,000 additional yeah, so units. We, yeah, we're trying to partner with uh, the government and also people who have been, you know, just have a lot of influence in the country that are interested. And so we've had multiple conversations over this past four or five months and everything seems pretty good. Like there's a lot of synergy. Everyone, well, I've never heard anyone say, yeah, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> like, we shouldn't give people clean yeah, water. That is, that is not something I care about. You're like, uh, that's never happened. Yeah. <laughs> but it usually getting people engaged either with resources like in kind or financially as well is what we're looking for and so we yeah from the u.s side um the the El, the El salvador amb ambassador to the u.s or i don't know how the word is but melina miorga has been a, a great champion of ours um to she's a bitcoin champion also is she so, really yeah 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 she's, I'm, I'm, she's she, been to a number of the bitcoin conferences no way and yeah yeah, yeah i'm gonna see forefront. her on wednesday i'll tell okay. her i'll ask her like hey what are you uh what are, you just gotta tell me some prompts and questions <laughs> so that I act, like, I act like i don't talk about <laughs> but but yeah so it's been awesome to see someone you know in, in dc you know in the embassy there um being able to champion that uh for us to connect with 
other you know key people who make the decisions in the country and to then be able to actually meet them and get to know them and my goodness like they're just their hearts are awesome they're like yeah we want to do this and now we're just trying to figure out what those details are and there's other people as well that i've been communicating with um, in the country that want to support um in fact i just got done with a meeting today uh with pastor toby jr He's a, his church is the Tabernacle Church. They've got a, like a bunch of churches in El Salvador. Yeah. He said, uh, Sean, we're in, how can we help? And just like the readiness, like, here's what we do. Here's what's going on. He's like, yep, that makes sense. Let's go, let's do this. We know we need it. Let's roll that out and make it happen. Let's help our people get clean water. And so it's been, uh, it's like the, all the stars have aligned to really make an impact. And it's not like, uh, it's not us. It's not like my nonprofit. It's not about that. It's us. And it's just putting all those pieces together and working together as a team to help those who are in need. And the more people we have, the better it is. And I know it works because we've been doing it for 10 years. And so we've been able to like really see the impact. And so I've been down here for the past week, just kind of building relationships with people and um, continuing to connect with local people in the rural areas and now connecting with people in leadership and I think there's going to be some really cool things that are going to happen out of it. And the fact that we're talking about Bitcoin now is making my head spin. And I love it. I love it. So where uh, where can people find out about your org? Where can they donate? Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get the Bitcoin donations up and going. But for now, where, <laughs> can, where can they donate? Where can they find you? Yeah, online, uh, just at oneatatime.org. Okay. Um, it's you, If you type in, like, as it sounds, you're not going to find it. But it's O-N-E-A-T-T-A. Time.org. So there's two T's in the middle. Um, or our organization is called ADA for short. So if you hear ADA, that's what one at a time is. It's just okay. ADA for short. Um, you can find us on Facebook and uh, Instagram. And unfortunately, uh, we are not really on Twitter. Yeah, I was telling you, you got to get on Twitter. So. Yeah, apparently I got to jump on the Twitter gang. I, I don't know. <laughs> I Maybe I'll tell someone, maybe someone can volunteer their time yeah, and they yeah. can start tweeting for us. <laughs> Find somebody young in your, uh, yeah. in your group and put them on that. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's how so. you find us is there. Or if you're in El Salvador, you can uh, somehow reach out to me and we can hang out. Either way, I'm always Perfect. up for that. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I love hearing about what you guys are doing and I appreciate you uh, spending the, the evening with us here. And yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll try to up your Bitcoin game here a little bit going forward. I feel like I'm in good hands. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.